Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. Special thanks to Iran Academia for uh, providing this opportunity to share with you one of the prominent topics in the feminist circle of Iranian women. First of all, I would like to give you an outline of this presentation. In this short time, I'm uh, going to wrap up my discussion in four parts. First, I give you an introduction to the topic, main goal and research approach, and then touch on two main aspects of this study, which uh, forms the two main pillars of this uh, topic, and briefly mentioning about the uh, research methodology. And uh, in the end, I will address uh, research findings and quote some uh, personal narratives uh, which is extracted from interviewees uh, to make this topic more tangible. Um, about the topic, um, the topic that I would like to discuss and share with you is the lived bodily experiences of Iranian women. The main goal of this research is to elaborate on how uh, political power uh, affects women embodied experiences by employing the uh, embodiment theory. The issue of um, Women's bodily autonomy is a hot topic in feminist discourse and has gained global attention in academic circles and the women's movement in recent years. Um, when you look at the main women's movement in the last decades, you probably noticed that uh, bodily experiences and bodily autonomy are the central of the movements. For example, uh, the women life freedom movement in Iran, uh, the fight against uh, abortion bans in the United States, the um, neo Namenos movement in Latin American countries against um, abortion restriction and femicide. And recently, uh, we witnessed the Afghan uh, women's struggle to remove the pork and uh, some specific dress code. These uprisings underscore uh, the need for a deeper exploration of women's bodily experiences as a crucial topic for knowledge production. In these movements and all topics related to um, bodily experiences, the central role of politics is evident. When discussing uh, female embodiment, the role of political power must uh, also be brought into the discussion because um, Dominant power regulates the bodies. Different form of power should be considered when uh, analyzing the lived bodily experiences of women. So as uh, my main focus is Iranian women in this research, I adopted a qualitative approach to uh, explaining how power dynamics within Iran shape women's bodily experiences and explore why the path to emancipation for Iranian women is often navigated through bodily agency. In this research, the body is investigated not just uh, as an object, but as a subject of experience. This allows us to see it as a mediator of uh, our interactions with the world. So uh, the body can be seen as a site of oppression and a site of resistance at the same time. Uh, for Iranian women, veiling uh, and wearing hijab is not just about putting a piece of mandatory fabric on the head or following a specific dress code. More importantly, this study discusses the influence of this kind of embodiment experiences on shaping identities, emotions, and sense of self. As uh, my exploration of women's narratives has revealed, mandatory hijab is a signifier that defines and confines womanhood in Iran. This discriminative rules lead to feelings of detachment and alienation from our bodies deeply impacting our minds. So uh, this study is focused on finding an answer to these key concerns, such as the main strategies and mechanism which is employed to regulate and control women's bodies. And uh, analyzing the contribution of some institutions like the role of the educational system from the early age of uh, six, seven years uh, on uh, girls' lives and other governmental institutions, such as the morality police, which is designed specifically to have constant surveillance on women's bodies. And the last concern, which is highly important to me to address, is uh, why returning and reclaiming the body serves as a profound act of emancipation and should be viewed as a 
a strategy for resistance and how Iranian women, by using their bodies in public spaces, attempt to show their resistance against patriarchal rules. And then uh, I want to uh, uh, going to briefly touch on two main aspects of uh, this research, which forms a theoretical framework. First, um, the interplay of women's bodily autonomy and the role of political power. In other words, I was looking for an answer to the question of how political power can impact female embodiment and which strategies are used. To understand this better, I've employed the concept of body politics, which allows us uh, to examine the political, uh, social, cultural forces that governs and influence uh, bodily experiences and self-perception. Uh, this study investigates power relations through the lens of Foucaultian concept of biopower. I've investigated how power dynamics manifest and how women resist such oppression. Also, the main institutions that play a significant role in creating a docile body are discussed. Based on interviews, the educational system and morality police are two main kinds of disciplinary forms of power that mainly impact women's lives. And the second framework of this study explores female embodiment experiences by using uh, embodiment theory. As you know, uh, the term uh, embodiment is based on a philosophical construct that uh, originates from Merleau-Ponty's works. He explained that everything we perceive of the world is mediated by the body and that it's impossible to understand who we are and how we interact and behave with others and the environment without understanding our bodies. Regarding my topic, the theory of embodiment is a framework that helped me understand how embodied experiences can be sometimes uh, disruptive to the lives of girls and women in Iran. So by uh, embodiment theory, I can understand how uh, the female body under constant surveillance and control uh, perceive the world and how this constant control can impact women's emotions and feelings. Uh, at the next part, I just want to touch on uh, the research methodology uh, very quick. Um, regarding methodology, uh, this research utilizes the phenomenological qualitative method uh, focused on in-depth semi-structured interviews. Uh, specifically, it focuses on the uh, experiences around their body and uh, imposing the specific way of uh, wearing hijab and dress code, which is done through different uh, strategies. The interviewees are Iranian women between uh, 25 and uh, 45 years old. Participants were chosen from various backgrounds uh, and uh, different group. Uh, question covered is women's bodily experiences concerning the Islamic government's policies toward controlling uh, women's bodies. Key questions guiding the interviews include the feelings and reflection of women regarding compulsory hijab, how they can see their bodies through various situations, what are their feelings about uh, being under constant observation and control through different uh, governmental institutions, and um, what their reactions to the first time that they uh, had to cover their hairs? What is the role of educational system in Iran to impose some values of being a good and modest girl in a school? And uh, what are their feelings in facing the morality police and generally about uh, this institution? In addition, uh, I asked them about the potential uh, restriction of mandatory hijab on their lives and uh, following um, missed opportunities that they had in their lives because of wearing uh, hijab and some specific dress code. Uh, generally, the aim of all question is uh, to find out how bodily experiences can affect 
short-term and long-term feelings and emotion in their lives. The next part, uh, which is the final part of this presentation, uh, my focus is on uh, main findings, which is extracted from the interviews. And I'm going to share uh, each part with a participant quotation to get closer and better understand uh, their feelings. For analyzing data, I've employed a thematic analysis to find patterns and interpret them. Findings uh, highlight um, how women navigate, perceive, and uh, push back social political structures that um, attempts to regulate their bodies and expressions. Throughout the diverse and rich conversation, I identified four main uh, dimensions. The first stem is about uh, societal pressures from an early age for girls. This refers to the intersection of religious beliefs, political policies, and societal expectation. This early pressure from the family uh, sometimes happens to ensure their daughters are socially accepted and avoid uh, societal backlash. Uh, the point is that among all these factors that make uh, decisions in women's life, there is no individual choice from the girl's side. All interviewees pointed out this uh, critical fact that they emphasize their lack of personal choice uh, for their uh, bodily choice. Uh, Raho, for example, in, in one quote says, when I was a child and went out with my younger brother, sister, uh, they could freely run in the street, but I had to wear the hijab. I remember running with them one time and my father told me it was inappropriate for me as a girl and I had to uphold the dignity of the hijab and being a modest girl. And also Mari in another quote says, my first memory of hijab dates back to when I was five. We had gone to a photo studio to take our pictures and uh, my father placed a head scarf on my head for the first time. I had long hair that reached my shoulders and I wanted to get my photo uh, taken just as I was. This made me feel terrible. People always compliment my beautiful hair and I wanted uh, to be visible in the photo. Even now looking at that photo upsets me. And uh, another theme is about the discipline of bodies uh, through institutionalized power. Uh, power, as you know, appears in various domains. Participants address two main institutions that uh, impacted their lives. Uh, the first, the educational system, um, schools, and uh, the morality police. Finding um, reveal a landscape where the state subject, subjugate um, a woman's body from an early age and Technically, the educational system keeps these ideologies alive and promotes them by defining a good and worthy girl as one who is obedient and has a tame body and accepts her uh, inferior status in the society. Moreover, other participants mentioned labeling girls in schools uh, who uh, defied oppressive rules with phrases like incompetent, indecent, unworthy, and unashamed, and the student's evaluation system are based on adhering to those imposed values. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one participant said, from childhood, we were conditioned to believe that a good girl is uh, dignified and obedient with her hijab. There was never emphasis on values like bravery or empowerment for girls in educational system. Their abilities were overlooked with a greater push towards being submissive and adhering to mandatory rules. Uh, the schooling system was such that girls without an appropriate hijab were labeled as unworthy. I emphasized uh, the significant impact of the educational system on uh, um, as it plays a crucial role in uh, shaping and instilling imposed ideologies from a young age. It starts from um, setting hijab and perpetuating to other sites of policing. Thus, uh, as Foucault discussed, this form of disciplinary power establishes a uh, norm and then measures individual against these standards. 
Establishing the morality police as a form of disciplinary power is a pivotal mechanism employed by the Islamic government of Iran to exercise and enforce political power in which the main goal is to control women's bodies by instilling a feeling of fear and punishment. This institution aims to turn women into tame subjects who adhere to adhere strictly to prescribed norms. Um, for example, in one quote, uh, uh, one of the interviewees said, in my opinion, while it's called a hijab, its essence is control and, sub uh, and uh, suppression. This control suppresses uh, many emotions within us, gradually instilling feelings of anger and resentment that influence other aspects of our lives. And another quote, uh, the first emotion that come to my mind when I think of the morality police are fear and insecurity. This fear and anger are always with me when I occupy a public spaces on the street. Um, another pattern uh, which I extracted from the interview is, was about emotional reflection of embodied experiences. As Merleau Ponty points out, the body is not just an uh, object, but uh, is a subject of experience. Our body is not just a passive entity, it actively plays a, um, an integral role in our understanding of the world. Understanding the body as a subject of ex experience emphasizes uh, the profound consequences of um, uh, uh, suppressive rules on women's lives because um, it has a significant psychological, emotions, uh, emotional and uh, severe trauma in our minds. For example, Nargis uh, sees hijab um, as an instrument to hide the part of women's thoughts. Uh, she says, wearing a hijab on my head didn't just mean covering my hair. It was also a way of hiding my thought gradually. Uh, this separation and control prevents me from living as my true self. Self-censorship has become a part of my life manifesting in my relationship. This censorship impacts every aspect of my life as a woman. In the narratives of many participants, there were uh, conflicts between the norm imposed by the dominant power and their own genuine uh, desire and beliefs. Also, another significant point highlighted by some participants regarding embodied experiences was the uh, movement restriction by wearing hijab uh, that comes with the um, veiling. Mm, and uh, some, uh, for example, some uh, the, the participant uh, pointed out about uh, the limitation of wearing some dress code in uh, in the workplace, and uh, it uh, leads to gender inequality for uh, in in the workplace. Furthermore, many participants uh, noted that um, uh, routinely concealing their bodies under multiple layers of clothing led to unique form of uh, body shaming when circumstances requires them to remove this uh, layer of clothing. This unfamiliarity often uh, translates to more than just discomfort. It leads to feeling of insecurity, self-doubt, and even shame. The last pattern uh, that I would like to discuss with you in this study, um, and uh, I was personally influenced by this theme, and it deeply affected me uh, emotionally and was uh, repeated again and again in most interviews narratives. This pattern is about unexperienced pleasures. Um, the, for example, one of participants says, uh, wearing the hijab uh, took away many pleasures from me. It made me so challenging that I would only go a few steps into this See, this severely limited the joy of feeling the water on my skin. Now it seems to me that we Iranian women deprived ourselves of many pleasures in various situations. I truly understood the joy of being in the water when I left Iran. And uh, in another quote, Mari said, um, one of the most uh, enormous restrictions uh, the mandatory dress code has imposed on me is, depri is depriving me of dancing. This deprivation uh, profoundly saddens me. This impossibility has turned into the greatest regret of my life. Um, 
And um, in, in other quotes, uh, one of participants says, cycling was always my favorite sport and I desire and I desire to do that uh, on all the streets freely. As I turned nine years old, uh, I was banned from doing that in public and running in the street without veiling, one of the pleasure I never tried. Um, these testimonies of uh, lost pleasure and dreams associated with a tangible physical challenge uh, revealed many frustration that had a meaningful impact on women's lives at this at this time when we when they um, were growing up. <laughs> Through their narratives, women directly talked about the limitation on their bodies, which had mental outcomes. These are not just uh, tales of missed opportunities, but narratives of uh, emotional and physical burdens of dreams, uh, which is differed, and of simple pleasure, which is denied. Unfortunately, consequences will last forever, and bodies will never forget what they have experienced. Thank you for listening, and I hope uh, this study has um, provided a new perspective on Iranian uh, the feminist studies. <laughs>